Okay. I too am jet lagged, came all the way from Seattle, so please bear with me here. I do want to make three uh, prefatory remarks. First, in terms of content, um, my focus here is more on the nature of the urbanization process rather than focusing on the, the urban or the city as such. Uh, second, a sort of theoretical comment. Um, similar to uh, John Pertebi's paper yesterday where he um, sort of proceeded from Deleuze's ontology in Difference and Repetition, I typically work with their political philosophy, uh, primarily the, um, the war machine and the state apparatus plateaus from a thousand plateaus. So my goal is um, asking whether or not this sort of political philosophy can be used as an ontology for critical urban studies. And third, this is a difficult proposition, a difficult question, um, in part because of people like uh, David Harvey, what they, he's been saying for decades is that the city is a special kind of commodity in terms of scale, the amount of investment required to create a city, the lifespan of the commodity, the different knowledges involved to create it. Okay, so Aduza Butari's thoughts on the capital and state relationship don't easily address this. They're not urban theorists, clearly. And my project is one of transforming what they have given us um, to better understand contemporary urbanization. And finally, I have a warning. This is a second pass, sort of rethinking and trying to generalize what I did in dissertation. So this is me trying to gather the results of uh, years worth of work. Okay, so I want to start with a quotation from Deleuze and Guattari in A Thousand Plateaus. It comes to mind every time I hear the words assemblage, assemblage theory, or assemblage urbanism. <clears throat> they write, the abstract machine does not exist independently of the assemblage any more than the assemblage functions independently of the machine. With this in mind, it is important to point out that in the realm of critical inquiry, critical urban inquiry, uh, the idea of assemblage has received plenty of theoretical attention, particularly in a 2009 volume called Urban Assemblages, which is primarily hacker network theory. Um, a 2011 debate across several issues of the journal City, and in a recent paper by uh, Michael Storper and Alan Scott that assesses uh, the state of contemporary critical urban thought. But the notion of the abstract machine, or the diagram, is all but absent in most of this literature. There are, however, at least two important exceptions to this oversight, one being Kim Dovey and also Michele Lencioni. Um, in his 2010 book, Dovey explains, uh, explicitly discusses abstract machines in relation to architectural and urban design, drawing a parallel to Des Deleuze's discussion in his book on Foucault of the Panopticon's diagram as a map of relations between forces that is realized in prisons, factories, schools, and hospitals, Dovey gives us another example, the dumbbell design of uh, shopping malls. That is a spatial form wherein anchor stores draw would-be shoppers past other retail um, offerings. It has uh, also appeared in other concrete assemblages, such as airports, waterfronts, and tourist destinations. Then in a more recent article, uh, co-authored with Ross King, he invokes the concept of the abstract machine as the assembly of forces, actors, actions, and desires struggling for political power in Bangkok. Um, in this case, the abstract machine is constituted by the state, the middle class, and the poor. The image from this was up on the board during this presentation. Um, all three of which challenge and depend on one another. Still, in an even more recent paper co-authored uh, co with Stephen Wood, he develops a typology of architectural interfaces between public and private spaces, and argues that characteristics such as accessibility, setback distances, transparency, occupancy, and privileged modes of transportation define the abstract machine that, quote, animates interface assemblages. Lancioni, by, con by contrast, focuses on the relations between people experiencing homelessness and the urban environments they inhabit. He explains the relationship between the two horizontal dimensions of an assemblage and its vertical axis, which is the realm of the abstract machine, and the power to, quote, open or close an assemblage. He writes about particular concrete assemblages, soup kitchens, clothing distribution centers, showering facilities, 
and ascribes their limits and possibilities to three broad abstract machines, love, bureaucracy, and work. So these are crucial precedents for thinking the production, thinking about the production of the urban environment. And my contribution is intended both as an addition to them and an attempt to generalize the relationship between the abstract machines of urbanization and urban assemblages. This is, I think, an important maneuver giving critical urban theorists, such as Neil Brenner's reluctance toward deleuze guattarian philosophy as ontology for theorizing urbanization. This is the whole debate that I referred to in the journal City in 2011. To this end, my work fits somewhere between Douglas, which engages, engages with various concrete dimensions of urban environments, and Lancioni's, which focuses on a particular marginalized population's experience. I'm interested in categories that are similar to Lancioni's in terms of their breadth, but like Dudley, I'm focused on the urban built environment. However, my work differs from both of theirs, I think, in two distinct but related ways. First, I do not embark from the materiality of the city and relationships within it, but rather from the plans, policies, studies, and media coverage that have circulated in relation to my case study, which is Seattle's South Lake Union neighborhood. <clears throat> Second, these archives are a testament to the shifting relationships among the forces conditioning how the built environment is produced. My attention, therefore, is currently directed toward how the process of urbanization itself unfolds rather than how urban spaces are used or experienced. This is an important addition to the realm of critical urban inquiry because it draws attention to the space between the dominant critical perspective that sees capitalist political economy as the exclusive driving force behind urbanization and what I feel is an exaggerated focus on the materiality of cities by advocates of assemblage urbanism. With that said, I want to turn to some crucial theoretical discussions before briefly sharing some of my empirical work. So abstract machines are clearly, by definition, abstract, while assemblages are arrangements of heterogeneous concrete elements. To my knowledge, there is no confusion on this point in the philosophical literature. Delanda is explicit when he writes, quote, the ontological status of assemblages is two-sided. As actual entities, all the differently scaled social assemblages are individual singularities, but the possibilities open to them at any given time are constrained by a distribution of universal singularities, the diagram of the assemblage, which is not, which is not actual, but virtual. Similarly, in a recent paper that challenges Delanda's insistence that Deleuze and Guattari do not provide a full-fledged assemblage theory, Thomas Nail asserts that the abstract machine is the condition of an assemblage, and that it, quote, lays out a set of relations wherein concrete elements and agencies appear. However, this consensus does not translate into agreement between those developing assemblage theory and the responses from the more loyalist camp of Deleuze and Guattari readers. Moreover, the loose threads that emerge become particularly problematic when they are drawn into critical urban studies. So beginning with Ian Buchanan's recent essay, um, Assemblage Theory and Its Discontents, I want to mention two points about how assemblage theory strays from Deleuze and Guattari's understanding of assemblages. Before turning to Stephen uh, Zepke's engagement with art to frame my attempt to sketch the three abstract machines, political economy, ethics, and aesthetics, that I think that should be I think should be considered when theorizing the contemporary urbanization process. So Buchanan's first critique of assemblage, assemblage theory addresses active network theory. So he kind of lumps those together and I'm understanding more and more as I'm as I'm here that this is problematic. Um, but his critique addresses actor network theory's focus on materiality. For Buchanan, the problem is not that non-human objects are granted agency. On the contrary, he calls this one of the greatest insights of assemblage theory. But um, the actor network theory makes this the centerpiece of its analysis rather than an element of a more broadly conceived assemblage theory. Latour's insistence that tracing the actants and their networks can reveal the distributed causality of complex events turns our attention away from the conceptual origin of the assemblages in Deleuze and Guattari's earlier concept of the desiring machine, 
which Buchanan traces to the Freudian notion of the complex. Buchanan's example here is Luzon Batari's reading of Freud's Little Hans case study, in which Hans avoids the street in an attempt to reduce his anxiety. The assemblage here is Hans, the horses he might encounter outside, and the resulting anxiety, which is clearly immaterial. Buchanan's second critique of assemblage theory engages Delanda's discussion of the 17th and 18th century um, emergence of the rational legal authority structure. Buchanan pits Delanda's account of slowly changing daily routines as the building up of the modern state against Deleuze and Guattari's universal history in Antiedipus, in which they write, the state was not formed in progressive stages. It appears fully armed, a master stroke executed all at once. The primordial Erschstadt the eternal model of everything the state wants to be and desires. Buchanan then points out three of Delanda's crucial, in his words, departures from Deleuze and Guattari. First, um, Buchanan asserts that Delanda moves from the concrete practices to the abstract, the state, while Deleuze and Guattari move from the idea of the state um, to its increasingly complex realizations. Second, he says that Delanda's focus on practices is a commitment to a transcendent real, while Deleuze and Guattari say that the state is always imminent. Third, he argues that Delanda reverses the relationship between the virtual and actual by taking the bits and pieces of the analysis, that is, his changing practices, to be the actual, while Deleuze and Guattari would say they were the virtual. So the actual, in Buchanan's account, would be the structure of authority. In sum, for Buchanan, Delanda's focus on the actual changes in an authority structure misses the real question, which is how is the structure of authority constituted? So there's a subtle difference here, and I'm not sure that I'm capable of addressing it sufficiently. But one potential path might be to consider the dynamic between the two concepts underpinning Deleuze and Guattari's universal history, which they call the war machine and the state apparatus in the Thousand Plateaus. If I'm reading Buchanan correctly, his issue with Delanda's focus on the actual practices of governance is that it misses the different domains of potentiality that are realized in such practices. In the case of urbanization, then, one research direction could be investigating how the contemporary relationship between the war machine and the state apparatus, that is, between global capital and a set of qualitatively differentiated models of realization, that includes the state, constitutes particular those always changing authority structures that pilot the urbanization process. This would be, I think, nothing less than mapping the abstract machines, conditioning how concrete urban assemblages are produced. In the introduction to his book, Art is an Abstract Machine, Zepke insists that, quote, a machine has to be constructed, and art as an abstract machine will require an artist adequate to the task, a mechanic, end quote. My case study, unfortunately, lacks the affirming nature of the art that Zepke discusses, but understanding the construction of abstract machines remains, and he provides two principles to guide us. First, the abstract machine is real and productive, not a representation. Or in Luz Guattari's words, quote, the diagrammatic or abstract machine does not function to represent even, so, even something real, but rather constructs a real that is yet to come, a new type of reality, end quote. This is a crucial insight when thinking about urbanization because it challenges the idea among the critical urban theorists, primarily Neil Brenner and his retinue, uh, that urban design and planning are primarily engaged in producing ideological representations that fail to capture the true forces, global capitalism and neoliberal policy driving urbanization. So that's what Brenner's saying. Neoliberalism, capitalism is what we need to focus on, always. Um, conversely, when they are considered as part of a machine, various design philosophies and strategies become a part of its motive force. This is a departure from the materialist reading of assemblages in which one can find assertions about, for example, the potential agency of sleek PowerPoint presentations. Such presentations are clearly part of the urbanization process, 
But my point is that the concrete assemblage of which they are a part should be taken as an invitation to explore the various virtual bits and pieces that the actual proposals draw together. Zepke's second principle is related to the first. He says, constructing an abstract machine is to construct construction itself. End quote. The abstract machine's nature is therefore one of means rather than ends. It is a relentless force of creation. Together, these principles highlight the fact that abstract machines must be built. So the empirical task when studying urbanization is not necessarily to focus on the material of the city, but is rather to understand the constitution of these machines. So although my research focuses on one Seattle neighborhood, I think what I've discovered is abstract enough to frame investigations into other cases that can affirm and build upon the three abstract machines that have emerged. But first, a few comments on the neighborhood that I study itself. So South Lake Union is one of the largest urban development projects in the United States and is under construction immediately to the north of downtown Seattle. Since 2001, uh, SLU is what I'm calling it, uh, which has been primarily developed by Vulcan, the investment and philanthropic giving firm of the Microsoft co-founder, Paul Allen, has been transforming from a light industrial neighborhood into something that mixes and blurs the lines between a residential neighborhood, a high-tech office park, a university campus, and an urban core. Its growth has accelerated since 2007 when Amazon um, agreed to le lease up to 1.6 million square feet in up to 11 new buildings to be developed by Vulcan and others before Amazon bought 11 buildings from Vulcan in 2012 for $1.1 billion. The neighborhood has been rezoned three times to accommodate more density, attract technology firms such as Facebook and Google, and other real estate uh, developers seeking to capitalize on Vulcan's success. And also has spilled over its uh, uh, southern boundary to drive the construction of new towers in an erstwhile desert of parking lots. Notable among these is Amazon's new corporate campus uh, that covers three city blocks and includes these three biospheres. While the vision for SLU's growth is typically attributed solely to Vulcan, with the city as the primarily enabler, since a proposal for an enormous park in the area, it was called the Seattle Commons, was rejected by voters in the mid-1990s, a careful archaeology helps map the set of machines that have emerged over the last 60 years to guide the development. My archive for this study includes legislation at the state and municipal levels, traditional and alternative journalism, official and academic studies and reports, design criteria, and public relations material. And together, these resources attest to the broad domains of political economy, ethics, and aesthetics, which cut across the traditional boundary between the state and capital. This is not at all to suggest that the state and capital are no longer useful distinctions, for as Deleuze and Guattari write, capitalism has reawakened the Erschach and given it new strength, but is, in, is instead rather to ask if these categories are in fact abstract enough for studying urbanization. Okay, so the interactions between the state or the models of realization and capital make it seem to me that we need something a little more complicated than those two categories. Uh, concretely, in the mid-1950s, long before the tenets of neoliberalism took hold of official and critical imaginations, the attempts to manage environmental issues and growth patterns in the Seattle region were underway. The main problem behind in early environmental initiatives was runaway algae growth, fueled by the flow of nutrients from new suburban wastewater treatment plants into nearby Lake Washington. This marks the first interjurisdictional effort to address environmental problems in the state of Washington. That is, it's the first step toward building a machine for coordinated urbanization. As post-war suburbanization continued, regulatory frameworks for guiding growth patterns that attempted to balance the health and the beauty of the environment, that is, ethico-aesthetic concerns, with continued economic development and the distribution of limited public resources were established at various scales of government. It is important to note that the state was the primary regulator in this era, and that it positioned itself against the flow of capital into Seattle's hinterlands. The regulatory framework included enabling le legislation at the state level 
that permitted counties and regional coalitions to establish uh, land use guidelines, as well as local attempts that were, at least in Seattle, incredibly diverse and democratic. But these efforts remained largely uncoordinated in terms of legal requirements. In Blues and Guattari's language, these movements fall squarely within the process of the capitalist war machine converting the state into one of its many models of realization. But I think we should nevertheless still understand the increasing robustness of the state, whether it's a force antagonistic to capitalist flows in the suburban, er uh, suburban areas, or is being reconstituted by its increasing coordination with the imperatives of capital in the age of neoliberalism, uh, to be part of the state's further development into a force capable of striding, securing, and expanding territory. This, however, raises the question of whether striding or organizing territory is strictly the purview of the state, or whether it should be taken as a shared project of capital and the various models of realization, including the state. The answer, I think, is clearly the latter. And the passage of the Washington State Growth Management Act in 1991 attests to a much more intricate web of coordination that, particularly with the appearance of SLU, begins to blur the formerly distinct line between the state and capital. While this tendency has been discussed before, notably under the rubrics of the growth machine and public, uh, private partnerships, I am not aware of any attempts to consider it in terms beyond economic development. Specifically with the GMA, the Growth Management Act, uh, the expected population growth in the region was to be funneled into cities where infrastructure already existed or where further investments would be made while the larger and most quickly growing cities were required to establish comprehensive plans to guide policy decisions. In Seattle, the city was divided into various urban villages, which you can see here, um, each of which would be expected to absorb particular shares of statewide growth targets. In addition to this quantitative distribution of bodies, a wide range of political, economic, ethical, and aesthetic factors were also present in the plan. Notably, a, central, a set of central values, a commitment to fostering economic development, a robust uh, neighborhood planning program in the 1990s, and design guidelines that would guarantee a predictable aesthetic, and which have, in fact, been invoked by the city to reject Vulcan's projects that would have contributed huge direct and indirect economic and quality of life benefits to the city. And they rejected them on aesthetic grounds. So this is right along the edge of the lake, um, originally, there were going to be 24 story towers here, and the uh, Washington State uh, uh, SEPA, I forget what the acronym stands for, uh, tries to protect views of the topography. So the heights of these buildings were reduced by eight stories um, to help maintain these views. The allowed, excuse me, the city didn't upzone as much as the city wanted, as much as Vulcan wanted in this case. The major shift, however, is that the previous centrality of the state in regulating land use is now scattered across many different models of realization, including citizens and institutions participating in planning, design firms creating aesthetic standards, the widespread media coverage of activity in the area, and Vulcan itself, which is an active participant in many of these fields. Current and former Vulcan employees are, for example, active members in the Neighborhood Community Council, and employed by the city, while architecture firms that both work for and lease office space in the neighborhood from Vulcan uh, supply members to the area's design review board. Moreover, new infrastructure, such as bioswales and a new electrical substation, which you can see here, is being designed and funded by various governmental departments and private entities that draw on a compatible set of political, economic, ethical and aesthetic concerns. Okay, so I'm out of time, but I want to conclude by saying that uh, this neighborhood's growth is compelling not because it gestures toward a new configuration of material elements per se, but rather because it embodies a change in the fields of political, economic, ethical, and aesthetic potentiality that can be, re that can be realized. Uh, the relatively simple regulatory structure that emerged to regulate land use in the post-war era is now becoming interwoven into a much larger web of coordination, which also includes a war machine that is not merely satisfied with transforming qualitative values into quantities to be manipulated, 
but which also actively participates in creating ethical and aesthetic standards for the area. Therefore, I'm arguing that rather than using the state capital dyad to think about this new regime of urbanization, it might be more fruitful to think more abstractly, to think in terms of the multiple types of abstract machines, that is, the multiple types of potentiality at work. Thanks. Thank you.